Welcome back to Engineering Tripos Part 2B 4F12 Computer Vision. In this second lecture on deep learning for computer vision, we'll be covering convolutional neural nets. If you missed the first lecture on multilayer perceptrons, you can access it via this link or via the link in the description. At the end of the previous lecture, we saw how there was a lot of structure in natural images. On the left, we have random samples from the space of all RGB images. In the middle, we have a photograph of a natural scene, and on the right, we have that photo's pixels shuffled randomly. The multilayer perceptrons we discussed view all of these as the same thing, or rather, they have no concept that images have structure and thus connect each neuron to every input pixel. In this lecture, we'll see how the technique of convolution, which we've covered previously in this course, can be used to help neural nets to see. Let's briefly review the concept of filter kernels and convolution. Here are two filter kernels, a blur kernel and a vertical edge kernel, being applied to some digits from the MNIST dataset. Note how these kernels find local structure in the image and communicate that by a high and low values in the output. Here are two more kernels, a horizontal bar kernel and a blob kernel. Note how the bar kernel finds the horizontal strokes of the 5 and 4, and how the blob kernel pulls out circular areas of negative space. These four kernels are further examples of feature engineering, as they were designed by humans to be applicable to a wide variety of scenarios. Of course, any 3x3 three three pattern can be used. Here is an animation of a convolution with two such filter kernels. In this case, the kernels are being plied at a stride of 2, resulting in a scaled output Z. Ideally, we want to learn filters like this from data, in the same way that we use multiperceptrons to do feature learning in the previous lecture. However, it is not immediately obvious how to turn convolution into linear algebra so that we can use it as part of a neural net. The fundamental idea on how to do this is to embed patches, as you see here. Each 3x3 three three patch in the input image X becomes a column in a larger matrix capital X, as you can see here. Then, we take our 3x3 three three filter kernels and embed them as rows in a matrix F, as seen here. Once we've done this, convolution becomes a matrix multiplication. Let's try replacing the hidden layer in our MLP with learned filter kernels in a convolutional layer, noted C here. These are shown as squares instead of circles, and the dimension of the filter kernels is in the brackets, in this case 5x5. Five five. Note that the output dimension at the bottom of the first two layers shows the number of channels and then the width and height of the image. See how the image has got a little smaller? That's because the filter kernels are being applied without padding, and thus we lose two pixels on either side of the image. This new version of the network solves the capacity problem with the input, since each filter kernel has only 25 learnable weights. But it causes a problem with the output layer. Whereas previously the output had 650 parameters, this new version has 51,850 parameters because the output of a convolutional layer is itself an image. We need a way of reducing the dimensionality of the image, which we'll do via pooling. So one approach is to use what's called average pooling. By passing a window over the image at a stride greater than one, and computing the average pixel values in each window, we can create a lower dimensionality image. In this case, we're using three by three windows applied with padding of one and a stride of two. The resulting image is smaller and contains a smoothed version of the input. Another way to do pooling is to use the maximum of the window instead of the average. This is interesting because it acts as a further nonlinearity in the network, which can allow features to move around within the input while having a reduced effect on the output. In this updated version of our MNIST convolutional neural net, we have added in a max pooling layer at a stride of two, which you can see denoted within the brackets using the at symbol. The pooling reduces the number of parameters by a factor of four, which is definitely an improvement. That taken care of, Let's see what kinds of filter kernels this network learns. Here is a visualization of the filters learned by the convolutional layer. Each 5x5 five five filter is shown separately in the middle, and you can see the corresponding output image on the right. 
some of these filter kernels are recognizably oriented edges or bars, and the central figure appears to be a kind of blob filter. And here we see the result of the max pool operation. Note how it broadens the response of the positive values. Uh, finally, each of the 10 classes has weights it applies to each channel of the output, as seen here, to result in the final classification vector. Now that we have specialized neural nets to work more efficiently and effectively on images, let's introduce a harder problem. This is the CIFAR-10 dataset. It is drawn from the 80 million tiny images dataset, which consists of almost 80 million 32 by 32 RGB images downloaded from the internet and labeled with one of 75,062 non-abstract nouns. Named after the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, CIFAR-10 consists of 60,000 images gathered from this larger set. These images belong to 10 classes, which are, in order from top to bottom, aeroplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer, dog, frog, horse, ship, and truck. As can be seen, the dataset contains a lot of intra-class variants, in addition to complications brought about by color and the much larger variety inherent in non-curated natural images. To handle this much more difficult problem, we need to make our network deeper. As you can see, each convolutional layer here is paired with a pooling operation. In essence, networks like these use the subsequent layers to trade spatial information for semantic information. C1 extracts low-level features of the kind we've already seen, edges, bars, that sort of thing, and the max pool allows these to move around a bit within the image, providing some translational invariance. These 32 low-level features are translated into channels in a 16 by 16 image, which is then the input for C3. This layer finds combinations of these low-level features and assembles them into parts. These part responses are smoothed by the next pooling operation before being passed to C5, which looks for structures made from the parts. These are smoothed again before being flattened into a 1024-dimensional vector, which is then embedded in a 64-dimensional space. Note that, as this is a deeper network, we use the ReLU activation instead of the hyperbolic tangent. There's a new thing happening here with the values right before the output. During training, we apply at this penultimate stage something called dropout, in which we randomly set values in this vector to zero. This trick makes it harder for the network to memorize the input data. A network like this, which has a large capacity, could potentially cheat by memorizing difficult inputs. Dropout makes it so that any perceptrons or feature kernels it would have used in this way may be randomly set to zero, making memorization much harder. This also forces the network to use multiple perceptrons when making a decision, which aids in robustness and generalization as well. Outside of training, however, we do not apply this filter, but let all values pass through to the final classifier. All that said, let's see how we do. We immediately notice that we do not do as well on these images as we did on MNIST. There are a few reasons for this, but the main one is that this problem is incredibly harder. Given that, it's impressive that we do this well, achieving around 80% accuracy. One useful thing to do when analyzing network performance is to look at more than one of the predicted classes. Here we see the top two labels for each image. It's a good sign that the network thinks the first image is either a cat or a dog, since cats and dogs can look quite similar. If it thought it could be a cat or an airplane, that would indicate something going wrong with the way the network is learning. Let's dig into this network and look at the filters it's learned. Uh, we see an interesting mix of features here. Uh, again, some of them are very recognizably oriented bars and edges. These are often the same across uh, all three channels, indicating that they're operating on the intensity of the image. Uh, however, we have other filters which pull out particular color combinations, like uh, the blue-green filter in the top right or the red edge filter on the left. When we threshold the responses from the previous layer and reduce the resolution, we begin to see how the network is able to pull out specific parts of the image with each filter. The next layer combines these features into interesting parts. Note how the filter responses for each channel are becoming increasingly sparse. The image sparsity becomes even more pronounced in this final convolutional layer. Uh, this sparsity is a very good sign. Uh, one common symptom of a model that's not training properly is that these later responses are very busy. Uh, situations like this one, where uh, many of the final filter responses are empty, while others are clearly firing on the body of the cat or its head, 
are a sign of a well-trained network. Before we move on, let's pull together everything that we've seen so far to make a recipe for training a deep neural net. An unwritten but incredibly important step, which is outside the scope of this lecture, is to go out and obtain a data set to work with. While in an educational setting like this one, we will use established benchmarks and data sets gathered by others, in the real world, you will need to gather your own data. Anyway, however you get the data set, you will need to divide it into training, validation, and test sets. In most cases, this will have been done for you already by the data set provider. Next, we want to shift and scale the pixel values in the images in the training set such that they have zero mean and unit variance. The mean and standard deviation for this can then be used to normalize the validation and test data. It is very important that the values are not computed from the full data set. Often, to avoid any contamination, default values for shifting and scaling are used which have been computed from a large set of natural images. Then, you need to pick a network architecture. You can design your own, of course, but I recommend that you always start from one or two architectures which have been proven to work well on similar problems. After that, select an optimization algorithm. In the early stages, this should be something like Atom, which is robust, stable, and works well for a wide range of data sets and networks. Once the preliminaries are over, we can get to training. An epoch here means one round of the network seeing all training examples. For some number of epochs, we will sample many batches, compute gradient estimates, update the weights, and evaluate on the validation data to get a sense of whether we have begun to overfit to the training data. If we are overfitting, then training performance will get better, while validation performance gets worse. We want to either stop training before this happens, or we want to reduce model capacity to prevent it from happening in the first place. Things like changing the model capacity, the learning rate, the mini batch size, and so forth are so-called hyperparameter changes, which is the whole point of having the validation set to begin with, as it allows us to try out different values and see what works the best. Finally, once we are happy with our model, we retrain on the training and validation data together and evaluate on the test data. It is tempting to go back to step five after step seven don't. If you do, you are now using the test set as your validation set. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, but it does mean that the test set has stopped being a useful measure of how well your model generalizes, and you'll need to find something else to measure that. Optimizing hyperparameters on the test set is how you get models that have excellent results on paper, but fail miserably at real-world problems. Don't do it. <clears throat> uh, the, the more you work with AI, uh, the more you'll come to realize that, at the end of the day, more than optimization algorithms or models or crazy training tricks, the best way to make your model better is by having more high-quality data, period. If you are put in charge of allocating time and money for a machine learning project, get the best data you can in as large a quantity as possible. Once you have all that wonderful data, you can augment it to turn it into even more data. Here's an example. We have an image of a moth on a flower. However, we can use five different crops of this one image to make five subtly different versions. Then we can flip all of those on the horizontal axis. Ten images for the price of one. Speaking of data, we will now look at the first truly large-scale classification data set, ImageNet. It consists of over 14 million images mapped to around 20,000 labels. The images are extremely varied, coming from a variety of different sources all over the internet, and have each been hand-labeled by one or more human labelers. One particular subset, which was constructed for the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge in 2012, arguably brought about the modern era of deep learning. It was challenging for multiple reasons. First, you had 1,000 classes, including different breeds of dogs, various kinds of mushrooms, teapots, mugs, footballs, insects, flowers, hugely varied, both inside and outside of the classes. Then there is the size, 1,000 images per class, and the images themselves at a resolution of 256 by 256. It was so big and so difficult that algorithms were evaluated on the top five error, meaning that an image was counted as correct if the correct label was within the top five predicted classes. Even with that forgiving metric, researchers struggled to do well. 
Convolutional neural nets in particular struggled. At the time, training a network on a smaller data set like MNIST or CIFAR-10 could take days, even weeks. Then, some clever researchers figured out how to use new capabilities on graphical processing units, or GPUs, to train neural nets. GPUs have been used for years to create complex 2D and 3D graphics for video games and user interfaces, and had architectures within them for doing pixel-specific operations massively in parallel at blinding speed. With a little effort, you can write shaders, which are programs that run on GPUs, for all sorts of computer vision algorithms. To see a demo in your browser, click on the link here for an implementation of canny edge detection, which we covered earlier in the course, implemented as GPU shaders and running in a web page. The brilliance of the network the researchers trained, which they called AlexNet, was that it was trained in a similar way, co-opting GPU hardware for use in neural net training. And it was fast. Days became hours, weeks became days. Suddenly, deep CNNs, or DNNs, could be trained on a problem like ImageNet in a reasonable time, and they excelled. This architecture was able to achieve a top five error rate of 15.3% on the ILS VRC 2012 dataset, a 10.8% improvement over the previous state of the art. You'll notice from the diagram that the structure is very similar to the network we used on CIFAR-10, but with everything scaled up significantly. In particular, we have a massive MLP at the end, performing the feature embedding once the images have been processed by the convolutional layers. AlexNet kicked off a revolution in computer vision as people began to explore just what could be achieved with DNNs now that they could be trained efficiently on modern GPU hardware. At the same time, GPU manufacturers like NVIDIA began developing GPUs specifically for these new machine learning workloads. One of the first things to be explored was just how deep a network could be and still train. Pretty soon, researchers ran into a problem. The ReLU activation function, while it kept the gradients from disappearing, did so by not saturating. The outputs of each layer were unbounded and could thus either explode or implode, causing numerical issues or gradient problems. What you really want is for the outputs of a neural net layer to be normally distributed with zero mean and unit variance. If you knew ahead of time the statistics of all the outputs, this would be trivial, but of course, we have no way of knowing this during training without computing them over the whole data set after each weight update, which would be prohibitively expensive. Batch normalization attempts to solve this by using the mini batch to estimate the mean and variance in the same way we use it to estimate the gradient. Then, once training is complete, we compute the true statistics and use those at test time. If for some reason we want the outputs to be distributed in some other way, we can also learn per layer shifting and scaling parameters gamma and beta. Armed with batch normalization, researchers could start to build incredibly deep networks. This diagram shows a residual network or ResNet of depth 34, but in 2015, only three years after AlexNet, a ResNet of depth 154 would attain a top five error rate of 3.57% on ImageNet, which is essentially the same error rate as a human expert. Let's look at the structure of ResNet. Uh, the first thing to notice here is the repetition. Aside from an initial layer that processes the image uh, and the final classifier, the network reuses the same structure again and again. Here we see a zoomed in version of that repeated structure. It consists of a convolutional layer followed by a batch normalization, a ReLU, and then another convolutional layer and a batch norm. It's paired with an identity transform, which passes the input unchanged, acting as a kind of bypass around these structures. Each residual block uh, takes the input, passes it to both the identity transform and this structure, and then adds the results together. The trick to how ResNet works is that at the start of training, there's a strong signal all the way uh, from the classification back to the input via these bypasses. The optimizer can then switch on one of these structures by updating its weights until such time as it saturates, at which point it can switch on the next one. As such, training can proceed without having to train every single convolutional layer all at the same time from the very beginning, uh, but rather only when they're needed. Let's look at some classification examples for ResNet. On the left, you see images from the COCO dataset, which is a good thing to test with as it does not overlap with ImageNet and thus functions as held out data. I've shown the top five labels here so you can get a sense of how well the network does at classifying these images from among the thousand classes it understands. Particularly impressive is how often the other four classes are appropriate to the image as well, demonstrating the robustness of the algorithm. 
It isn't always right, of course, but it does remarkably well, and importantly, its mistakes make sense. Uh, except for that one where it thinks the children on the train are heading to a guillotine. I don't have any idea what's going on there. Let's return to our CIFAR network again for a moment. As I've said before, we want to reduce network capacity whenever we can if we can do so while maintaining performance. One interesting thing about this style of DNN is that we use almost as many parameters in the final layer as we do in the rest of the network. It would be great to find a way to reduce that capacity. One way is via fully convolutional networks. Instead of flattening the final image into a long vector and feeding it into a fully connected layer, we instead perform one by one convolution. This trick, also called network in network convolution, makes it so that we essentially apply several miniature fully connected layers at each pixel instead of a single large one. In this case, you essentially have 16 separate 10 neuron neural nets with 128 inputs, since the operation is being performed over the channels instead of over the spatial dimension of the image. Classification is then performed via a global average pool over this final image to get a 10 dimensional output. This brings the parameters of the final classifier into line with the rest of the network and allows us to reduce our capacity even further. Importantly, this reduction in capacity does not result in a reduction in performance. This FCN does just as well as our previous network with half as many parameters. However, the FCN has a really interesting property. If we look at the penultimate layer, we see that the filter response that corresponds to frog lights up at the location where the frog is in the input image. This makes sense, of course, but opens up the interesting possibility that we could use FCNs to label the pixels of an image with their class. And this process is known as semantic segmentation. Enter the COCO dataset, which I've mentioned a few times before. COCO, short for Common Objects in Context, consists of 330,000 images which contain 1.5 million object instances. They depict scenes of stuff drawn from 91 classes co-occurring in typical ways. In particular, the stuff in the images has been hand segmented such that there are pixel level ground truth labels that can be used during training. Here's a sample image with its segmentation and objects. With data like this, we can really explore semantic segmentation because we have class labels for each pixel. Here's an example of an FCN that can perform semantic segmentation. Uh, the first thing to notice is that we have a new kind of block in the diagram, a backbone or BB block. This means that we are building our network on top of the backbone of another network, in this case, a pre-trained ResNet50. This network has the same weights, but has been altered slightly by replacing some of the scaling operations so that the resolution doesn't drop quite so much as it normally would. As you can see here, the resolution is 87 by 65, but still has 2048 channels as a ResNet usually would before the final classifier. This then gets passed to a convolutional layer and then to a network in network layer before being upscaled via bilinear interpolation. Here is a video of a polo match in which we have horses and people, of course, but also cows, buses, cars, chairs, dogs, and a motorbike in the background. The FCN is applied on each frame independently, and the class with the maximum probability is shown with a color corresponding to the legend on top. As you can see, the network is able to find and classify many regions in each image despite challenging poses and occlusions. If you're intrigued by the game and would like to take a break from revision and watch some polo, the link to the full match is in the description. So far in these lectures, we've focused on classification, but there are other problems that CNNs can tackle. What if our data does not have any labels? In that case, we may want to discover structure in it or create a generative model of the data itself. One approach to this problem is called variational autoencoding. In a variational autoencoder, we have two networks. The first is an encoder, which takes an image as input and produces a vector, much like we've seen for classification. However, what happens next is very interesting. Instead of classifying the input, we interpret the predicted vector as the mean and log variance of a normal distribution and sample from it. This produces a latent vector Z, as you see here. We then feed Z as the input of a second network, which performs convolution in reverse, known as transposed convolution. Whereas the first network trades spatial resolution for semantic information, the second network trades semantic information for spatial resolution. The final result is the original image, which we can then use to construct a loss function. 
This method of constructing a problem such that a data set automatically produces its own labels is known as self-supervision. Training this network requires a very different kind of loss function. It has two parts. The first is a data likelihood term in which we see how likely the image X is given the latent vector Z. For this, we need a probability distribution P of X given Z, which we model using the decoder network. The second is a KL divergence like we saw in the previous lecture, though in this case, we want the samples from Q, which we implement using the encoder network, to be indistinguishable from a target distribution T, which is often a normal distribution of zero mean and unit variance. The new layer I just mentioned is called a transposed convolution layer. It essentially performs convolution in reverse. Instead of multiplying the filter kernel by a window in the input and writing the sum to a pixel in the output, instead we scale the filter kernel by a single pixel in the input and add it to the output, as you see here. This is the convolution animation from earlier. Here we have two filter kernels which are being applied at a stride of two with a padding of one. We end up with two very different scaled images which do not resemble the original. However, those two filter kernels were chosen very carefully. This animation shows a transposed convolution filter kernel turning the semantic information back into spatial information. As you can see, we are able to perfectly reconstruct the original image. This is an animation showing an exploration of the latent space of a variational autoencoder trained on MNIST. In this case, the latent space is only two-dimensional, which enables us to see a few things. First, numbers which look similar are near each other, or in some cases intersect each other in the latent space. Threes and eights, for example, are clustered in the middle. The overall density of the data points resembles a normal distribution, which is the work of the second term in the loss, while the result of passing the 2D vector through the decoder is shown on the right, images which are clearly handwritten digits. One thing to note here is that the latent space is coherent and that we are able to sample images which did not exist in the original dataset yet are still plausible digits. We saw with semantic segmentation how a CNN could label each pixel with a distribution over classes. One drawback of this approach is that if there are multiple members of a class, uh, for example, people, they will all be given the same label. If we want to give them different labels, this is called instance segmentation, or more generally, object detection. The COCO dataset, in addition to having per pixel labels, also contains bounding boxes around each object instance. This allows us to train a CNN to perform object detection. One way to detect objects in an image is to train a classification network and then find which pixels contribute to each output class. This is called salience or attribution. While this is not a perfect method, it is fast and can be used to explain the network's predictions. What we do is we grab the outputs of the final parts of a ResNet or some other DNN right before it loses its spatial dimension, and we multiply it by the gradient with respect to the class that we want to examine. This creates a mask that we can use to get a sense of which pixels contribute to the label of a particular class. For example, here's an image we've seen before. ResNet predicts a label of steam locomotive for this image. If we use salience analysis, we get this mask in the middle, which shows which pixels activated the most for the label of steam locomotive. We can also get the salience mask for the stone wall class, even though it was not predicted by the network. Salience is a useful debugging tool, but it's not precise enough for practical use. For this, you want bounding box prediction, where a system predicts a tight rectangle around each detected object in the image. One such system is called You Only Look Once, or YOLO. Describing everything about how YOLO works is outside the scope of this lecture, but I'll give a high-level overview. YOLO is a CNN which predicts both bounding boxes and class labels for each object instance in an image. It does this by dividing the image into an S by S grid of cells, as you can see here, and then for each cell, predicting one or more bounding boxes, as well as a class label. The network is trained using a loss function that incorporates sum of squared errors for the bounding box values and cross entropy for the class labels. If you want to learn more about YOLO, there's a link in the description. Here we can see the Polo video from earlier, but this time with YOLO running, 
Not only can it find all the people and the horses, but it can even find small objects like the polo ball. So now we've seen how we can use a CNN to detect distinct instances of a class in an image, but sometimes what we need is to identify whether a particular instance is one we've seen before. Here is a group photo, including a large number of people. One useful task would be to automatically label known people in the image. We can slide a window over the image and detect people in the window, but we're going to need to use a different network to find people we've seen before. This task is called recognition. The problem I've just described is an example of face recognition, where we want to detect that there is a face in the image and then recognize which person it is. In many ways, this is a much harder task than detection alone, as it requires the network to learn to recognize the same person's face in different poses, lighting conditions, and so forth, not to mention appearance changes like makeup and facial hair. The labeled faces in the wild or LFW dataset contains 13,000 images of faces collected from across the internet. Each face has been labeled with the name of the person pictured. There are over 2,000 individuals in total, of which 804 have more than one image associated with them. For this task, we'll be using a backbone network again, but we will be doing something very different with it. FaceNet, which we see here, embeds each face image in a latent space which has the property that faces of the same person are next to each other and far away from faces of other people. To train this network, we'll use what's called a triplet loss, as it is constructed using three images. The first is called the anchor. The second is an image of the same person, a positive example. The third is an image of a different person known as the negative. We want to simultaneously minimize the distance between the anchor and the positive example while maximizing the distance between the anchor and the negative example while maintaining a safety margin. Furthermore, we will force the embedding to be on the unit hypersphere, which helps constrain the problem and make it tractable. This results in the loss written here. Note that the quantity in the sum has a subscripted plus sign. This means that, similar to the perceptron in the last lecture, this network only learns from its mistakes. Only triplets, where the negative example is nearer to the anchor than the positive example, accounting for the margin, will be used to update the network. This animation shows FaceNet being trained on a data set of eight people with a 2D embedding space. First, note how jumpy the loss is during training. This is because the set of triplets we use is constantly changing as the network learns the embedding, and also, because there's no unique solution to this problem. Indeed, there are infinite solutions which satisfy the constraints we provided, and the network is free to choose any of them, and is switching between them freely during training as it approaches a correct embedding. This is why we only train on the positive triplets, as otherwise, training may never converge. Second, note how over time the network learns to spread the images for each subject at equal distances around the circle in order to respect the margin constraint while keeping all points on the unit hypersphere, which in 2D is, of course, a circle. Over the course of these lectures, we've looked at a few examples of how we can use backpropagation to manipulate inputs so that they produce unexpected outputs. This is called an adversarial attack and it is a serious concern to keep in mind when building a system that incorporates a DNN as a component. In particular, as inputs grow in size, the distance to the nearest decision hyperplane decreases due to the curse of dimensionality. For example, this animation shows what changes are needed to convince ResNet50 that a picture of a panda is actually a football. On the left, you can see the altered input. I promise you it really has changed, but it is almost imperceptible to us. To the network, however, this image is as much a football as it previously was a panda. More worrying still, these principles can be applied in the real world. In 2017, researchers demonstrated that they could use stickers to fool a DNN into thinking a stop sign was a 40 mile per hour speed limit sign for a wide variety of distances, angles, and lighting conditions. 
On the left, you see the black and white patches the optimizer found in the digital domain. And on the right, you can see the same applied as stickers to a real-world stop sign to achieve the same effect. As future engineers, you will need to be aware of these and other weaknesses of AI as you incorporate it into real-world systems. Like everything else you've learned, it's a tool, a powerful one. But if you stay curious and keep learning, you'll be able to use it to engineer a better future. Thank you again for watching, no matter who you are. If you happen to miss the first lecture, you can find a link to it here. Uh, as before, a list of references and links is in the description, as well as a link to a GitHub repo with resources you can use to continue learning at your own pace. If you stumbled across this video, found it helpful, and would like me to make more videos like it, please let me know in the comments. If there is a particular topic you would like me to cover, be sure to mention it. Whatever the case, I'll see you next time.